So, as we were discussing in the previous lectures, uh, next generation optical networks and the role of MPLS in next generation optical networks. Uh, as we have already discussed uh, here that uh, uh, we have uh, an IP networks uh, and an ATM which runs over a SONET SDH and we have a I optical or a DWDM networks uh, uh, at the physical layer. So, as you can see from uh, this slide that uh, uh, essentially the job of uh, SONET SDH uh, is to provide multiplexing and also to provide protection and restoration capability. Uh, at the fiber level. The ATM provides uh, most of the transport functionalities and integration of multiple services. So, this is the job of the ATM and of course, the IP is run over all these networks to provide uh, internet services. <coughs> now, uh, at the physical layer, you could have uh, optical or DWDM networks to increase the capacity. Uh, so, these are basically fiber based networks. Uh, if you do not need high capacity, then you could just have IP ATM SONET SDH networks. Now, as we already discussed that the evolution of optical networks is taking place from this four layer networks to a two layer networks. And as we can see the transition that this ATM layer is completely replaced by IP MPLS and later on uh, the SONET or SDH layer al also may be replaced. So, if you can see here why ATM network was used, the ATM network was primarily used to provide the traffic engineering capabilities in the core networks and for providing integration of multiple services. We have already discussed that uh, the traffic engineering capabilities uh, and integration of multiple services, the service multiplexing can be accomplished by a combination of IP and MPLS networks. So, really speaking in the next generation networks, uh, all the job of ATM can be done today. Uh, by IP and MPLS and wherever we need the quality of service uh, guarantees, uh, we can uh, we can incorporate those quality of service guarantees uh, in the IPQOS model as well and, and, and that IPQOS model can be extended to an MPLS based network that we have uh, already discussed. Uh, now, uh, as we are evolving, as the optical networks are evolving to the next generation networks, we can see that even the uh, SDH layer, that is even the SONET layer can be replaced uh, by the DWDM networks. You no longer require the uh, SDH or SONET layer as we grow to a higher capacity fiber optic networks, then you just need the DWDM at the physical layer. Now, at that point, uh, if you do not have the SONET layer, if you are just having a dark fiber with DWDM uh, 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 used to light up the fiber, then if the services integration, uh, transport, uh, all services need to be provided uh, by uh, a combination of IP MPLS networks, then it is very clear that protection and restoration capabilities will also have to be provided by MPLS network and uh, or uh, by using the capabilities of the IP restorations. So, that is where we were looking at really that how MPLS, uh, how the traffic engineering capabilities of the MPLS can be used to provide protection and restoration at the optical networks. So, we will as we have already seen that when the IP network uh, is run over an optical network like a DWDM based networks directly IP over DWDM, we can either have a overlay model or we can have a peer to peer model. In the overlay model, uh, the IP over optical networks uh, works in a similar fashion as we have seen IP over ATM overlay model. In an integrated uh, peer to peer networks, there are no separate control planes for IP routing and optical routing. Uh, as a matter of fact, the IP routing is integrated with the optical routing and a single control plane exists. Uh, now, let us first look at the overlay model. We have been looking at uh, uh, sort of the overlay model. Uh, uh, so, that is we have already seen that in overlay model, there are two separate control planes and in peer model, uh, there is only a 
single control plane. So this is like uh, our overlay model. We have these are optical routers which are situated at the edge of the networks and in the core of the network we have these uh, wavelength routers. Uh, and what is done really is that that this optical network, this IP networks is overlaid over this optical network which comprises of the wavelength routers. In the peer to peer model as you can see that uh, <coughs> now what happens in the overlay model, um, uh, there are two separate routing protocols that are in place, one is the IP routing, another one is the optical routing. Uh, now uh, uh, so what happens in the IP routing, uh, the, uh, the routes are determined based on the IP addresses by the IP routing protocol and in the uh, uh, optical networks this light path may either may have been statically provisioned or they may be dynamically determined. In either of these cases what happens is that this route determined based on IP addresses is then overlaid over the light paths which have been determined by using some optical routing protocol. But in the peer to peer model the optical route themselves are determined uh, by using intelligence from the IP routing protocol. So here as you can see in the peer to peer model the wavelength uh, uh, routers also participate in the IP routing. <coughs> So let us look at uh, the control plane as I was just discussing uh, in overlay model you can either have a static overlay model or you can have a uh, dynamic overlay model. Uh, so dynamic overlay model will do the wavelength provision, provisioning dynamically using uh, basically uh, you know wavelength routers and these wavelength routers are nothing but optical cross connects which with some routing intelligence okay. On the other hand in the static overlay model you just have a plain optical cross connects uh, and then your light path you can provision it statically okay and then fix it. Uh, the dynamic overlay model allows you to do the provisioning of the wavelength uh, you know uh, dynamically. Uh, so uh, as you were looking at how protection and restoration uh, will be done in this overlay model both in the static overlay model as well as in the dynamic overlay model. Uh, so the protection mechanism is actually limited at the optical transport layer and uh, if it is uh, uh, the transport layer is based on uh, the SDH then you are actually using the protection and the restoration capabilities of the SONET SDH. You can also have a restoration uh, at the IP layer also but as we had discussed there are uh, problems if uh, by using uh, the techniques of restoration at the IP layer essentially because of the large restoration times uh, which are there with the standard IP routing protocol and which can range. Uh, of the order of several seconds. We can of course uh, um, get around this problem by decreasing the timer values but then it will lead to an excessive amount of uh, traffic. Uh, now therefore if you have to really do restoration or protection at the IP layer we may have to use some of the capabilities which are provided by the MPLS traffic engineering and we will see how MPLS traffic engineering uh, based mechanisms can provide protection and uh, restorations. So uh, the MPLS based protection and restorations what you can do is that in MPLS the backup path is created okay. The, so there is a primary label switch path to forward the traffic from an ingress to an egress. So there is a primary uh, backup path and that there is an there is a primary uh, label switch path and then there is a secondary label switch path which also exists. So whenever a primary backup path fails okay the the traffic which was flowing on the primary backup path then gets automatically routed on the secondary label switch path so as a result you know uh, a protection can be provided when the uh, secondary backup path is not uh, required by this traffic which is right now following the primary backup path then this secondary LSP uh, can also be used to forward the low priority traffic you know uh, uh, maybe a best effort traffic or some other traffic it can forward it. Whenever the primary label switch path fails then that high priority traffic which was going on to the primary LSP path can then preempt this low priority traffic which is going on the secondary LSP path and then it can start getting forwarded on the secondary LSP path. So this is really a scenario which you can see here is that 
right? There is a primary label switch path shown by this red line from A to B uh, network which is passing through these routers A, W, X, Z and then there is a secondary label switch path shown here which is going from A, W, Z to B. Now let us say if this link uh, fails or if this link breaks down then the traffic cannot go on this link and whenever it, it is detected by X and uh, the and, and the W comes to know that this link has uh, broken down then it can start forwarding the packet on the secondary uh, backup path. Uh, typically therefore, you know this will have a uh, uh, better restoration time than at the IP layer. So, MPLS traffic engineering has been standardized MPLS T for the protection purposes. Uh, that has certain traffic trunk resilience attribute. So, whenever you set up uh, a traffic engineered path, uh, you need to associate before you set up uh, the traffic engineered path as a part of the signaling protocol, as a part of the signaling used for MPLST, you need to specify what are the traffic trunk resilience attributes and they specify how to react when the label switch path of the traffic trunk does not exist anymore. So, the traffic trunk uh, resilience attribute will actually uh, specify how they react. So, this, this should be uh, specified as a part of the signaling protocol for setting up uh, uh, you know the traffic engineered paths. Then the restoration, uh, so typically the, rest, the manner in which restoration is done is the failure is detected by the uh, label switch router which is uh, closest to the failure and then the routing protocol uh, detects the failures okay and the label <coughs> uh, uh, and the lsa the labels which advertisements are flooded and the head end lsr then detects the failures and the backup lsp is restored okay so this is how uh, you know it uh, uh, I, I was just discussing that if this link fails down then the x detects this failure x will send all lsas to y and w so this head end lsr w comes to know that this link has broken down and it will immediately restore the backup lsp which was already in place from a w z to b okay there could also be a uh, fast reroute uh, mechanism uh, and this is like this is this acts like a uh, local protection for a link or node failure very similar to a sonnet or sdh networks uh, so now what happens in the fast reroute mechanism that there is a backup lsp tunnels for the lsp tunnels which are traversing around a node and in case of failure the affected lsp tunnels are rerouted okay uh, around a failed node using the backup lsp tunnel uh, so, so it is like this that if this node you know uh, this node breaks down then there may be a backup LSP around this node itself. So, then all the packets they so they cannot be forwarded on the this link then they may get forwarded from x to y and then from y to z and then come here. So, there may be a uh, fast reroute done around the node x which detected the failure ok. Obviously, here uh, the uh, uh, the restoration time is much less. So, that is the reason it is called fast reroute, but the paths that are chosen may, may be suboptimal. Uh, so, what is however, this is only a transient or temporary phenomenon. So, what happens is that a local rerouting then also takes place at the same time and then when a uh, new LSP is set up the traffic is then switched from this alternate LSP uh, that is the fast uh, reroute LSP to this uh, newly set up LSP it is again rerouted. So, that the uh, suboptimality in terms of forwarding the traffic is only there for a uh, fraction of a second ok. So, this the MPLS fast reroute capabilities actually gives you a faster restoration time compared to a backup LSP or the IP restorations. Uh, so, in summary you know what happens is that that what we are saying is that in the core of the networks uh, we have this optical based networks which is based on this uh, uh, wavelength router and over which we are overlaying the IP networks. But when we are overlaying the IP networks, we are also running MPLS primarily to provide uh, you know traffic engineering capabilities in the networks. So, as a part of MPLS traffic engineering signaling protocols, we will not only set up the uh, primary LSP path, but we will also set up the secondary LSP paths okay, which may be around each node in case of link failure or detection or completely a secondary LSP path which may be woken up whenever the primary LSP path fails 
okay so these are the uh, protection and the restoration mechanism which are available uh, in terms of mpls traffic engineering capabilities uh, in dynamic so this is in the static overlay model now as we have already discussed again in the static overlay model the light paths have been statically provisioned and they are dumb optical cross connects which have been used uh, uh, in the core of the networks as opposed to that in dynamic overlay model we have these wavelength routers which are basically optical cross connect with routing intelligence and they can do dynamic wavelength provisioning so the routing in optical transport networks is based on wavelength routings and by using uh, a wavelength routing light paths can be dynamically provisioned however the ip routing does not participate in wavelength routing okay so uh, since it is an overlay model the ip routing uh, intelligence uh, is not used for wavelength routing so there is a separate control plane for ip routing of course and there is a separate control plane for wavelength routing so uh, so this is how uh, it works here there is an ip router a and there is an ip router b and these are wavelength routers uh, so a light path has been set up using an optical routing uh, intelligence and uh, uh, the ip routers however determine uh, their routes based on the uh, ip addresses uh, only uh, now there is a uh, control plane for uh, uh, optical cross connects okay uh, now this is like for uh, the control plane for uh, wavelength routers uh, you require uh, to have a uh, now since in this case the light paths are not statically provisioned you require to have a dynamic establishment of uh, light path which includes uh, features like neighbor discovery link state uh, update route computations and uh, uh, the uh, path establishment okay so these are the features which are required uh, for uh, dynamically establishing the uh, optical uh, path uh, then uh, these optical paths uh, you can also do the uh, uh, traffic engineering on these optical paths and you can also provision the bandwidths of these optical paths you of course uh, need to have a uh, restoration and protection capabilities in the optical paths then the question really is that what kind of control plane we can have for these optical cross connects okay now uh, again i want to emphasize here uh, that the control plane for the uh, ip uh, routing ip router says uh, there is a, a routing plane okay which is uh, the intelligence used in determining the routes based on of ip addresses we had seen that mpls has a significant utility as a control plane in the ip routers itself to provide traffic engineering now here is a set of wavelength routers in wavelength routers we are saying that we will do this dynamic wavelength provisioning but we need a control plane for the wavelength routers also now we need a control plane which should be able to do dynamic wavelength provisioning which should be able to do traffic engineering which should be able to do bandwidth provisioning which should be able to do the optical routing which should be able to determine the neighboring uh, uh, nodes uh, and so on so the question really is that what is the best control plane for the optical cross connect it turns out that mpls with certain modifications can actually act as a good control plane even for the optical cross connects so that leads to an integrated ip optical peer model that is what you know we were discussing so instead of overlay model if i am using the uh, mpls to be a control plane for optical cross connects uh, then I can also use uh, to determine this traffic engineering path I can also use a knowledge of the IP routing and if the edge of the networks I am having this IP routers also with the MPLS as the as the control plane then I am having an integrated uh, intelligent next generation optical network which is based on this peer to peer uh, model except that when we are using MPLS as the control plane for the optical cross connect we need to make certain changes in the MPLS protocol to take care of the fact that it is now have to manipulate this optical cross connects and not the uh, IP packets okay so uh, that leads to the development of what we call as the generalized multi protocol label switching protocol or the GMPLS now let's look at the integrated IP uh, optical peer model so in peer model you know only one control plane as we were discussing spans an administrative domain 
and uh, the routing adjacencies uh, are of the order n so only allowing so so allowing routing protocols to scale okay as you can as you have seen that in the overlay model both when we are having ip over atm and uh, as well as ip over optical the routing adjacencies were really of order n square and therefore the routing protocols were really not scaling and what should be the control plane so as we had just discussed MPLS has a great potential of becoming a common control plane for IP as well as wavelength routing because what happens really is that MPLS will then collapse the optical transport as well as the service layer into one single layer and that is like a, uh, uh, a uniform integrated control plane. So what we are essentially saying is that not only we have integrated the wavelength based routing with IP routing in providing a peer to peer model but in the form of MPLS we have also got a unified control plane covering from IP routers to the wavelength routers okay and this really leads to a great powerful framework for the next generation you know core networks. So this is how uh, it looks like you can see this is an edge LSR a label switch router which is basically an IP router with MPLS control plane but these are optical cross connects label switch routers in the core of the networks which are using MPLS as the control plane and these are inter uh, these are uh, 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 the light paths are actually provisioned by using the traffic engineering capabilities of the MPLS networks. So this is like an integrated IP optical architectures which is which is truly a next generation uh, optical networks. Uh, so uh, let us look at uh, what changes or features we have to add uh, in order to make uh, MPLS as the control plane for the next generation optical networks. Okay. Now again uh, when we have to make these changes uh, in the MPLS to act as a control plane for the optical cross connects we have to take care of the fact that uh, in the core of the networks which is based on optical cross connect MPLS is basically used to configure and set up the wavelengths. Okay. Uh, when this core network was based purely on the IP based networks then the MPLS was actually used to set up the uh, traffic engineered path but operate on the uh, IP packets. Okay. Now here it will set up the wavelength okay, and it will configure the wavelength provisioning so therefore you know it has to act uh, on the uh, on the wavelength rather than on the labels or IP headers. Okay. So labels here in MPLS they are actually analogous to optical channels and both the uh, label switch path and wavelength routers uh, they have uh, uh, of course they have separate data and control planes uh, and they the, the wavelength routers have uh, 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 separate data planes in the, in the form of wavelength routing and the label switch routers of course are acting on the uh, IP labels. So now the LSR uh, the edge LSR it provides virtual point to point unidirectional LSP and the wavelength router will provide uh, uh, point to point li light path while the LSR will maintain the next hop label forwarding entries the wavelength router maintains the cross connect table. The wavelength router while toggles wavelength from an input port to an output port a label switch router will typically uh, you know uh, do the label swapping paradigm. Okay. So this is the difference between a standard so I should call this to be a standard label switch routers and a standard wavelength router. A standard wavelength router will act on point to point light path. Uh, the standard wavelength router will actually maintain a cross connect table and it will uh, it will uh, do the cross connection of wavelength from an input port to an output port as opposed to this a label switch routers actually do the label swapping uh, paradigm it maintains next hop label forwarding entries okay and it's it's it switches uh, from an input port to an output port essentially a packet okay so, uh, so these changes needs to be incorporated to an MPLS and this gives rise to what we call as the multi protocol lambda switching. So instead of label switching we have this uh, new term which is called as the lambda switching. So what we are saying is that in the integrated optical peer model in the core of the networks optical cross connects 
or wavelength routers with MPLS as the control intelligence are nothing but multi protocol lambda switch routers. Okay. So, instead of M so instead of this L being standing for the labels now it stands here for lambda. Okay. So, this multi protocol lambda switch routers essentially they are optical cross connects uh, with MPLS as the control plane and uh, at the edge this LSR will aggregate the IP traffic flows to high bandwidth traffic trunks. Okay. The link state routing protocol like uh, OSPF etc uh, uh, with modifications to take care of the optical domain characteristics they will distribute the optical transport network topology. We then have the constraint based routing algorithm which will compute the routes through the optical networks and in this constraint based routing algorithms we can take into account the constraints related to the bandwidth or traffic engineering capabilities and then you know compute the routes through the optical networks. Finally, we can use signaling protocol like CRLDP or RSVP uh, to establish the light paths and that the traffic trunk at the edge of the networks can be mapped to the light path. So, the process if you see in this is, is something like this that in the core of the network you uh, determine uh, the light paths okay, and this light path you determine by using uh, routing protocols like OSPF etc and you have to make modifications to the OSPF to take care of the optical domain characteristics. So, you distribute the optical transport network topology then you, uh, you use traffic engineering criteria and then you determine a path from one node to another node uh, by uh, using some constraint based routing algorithms and then at the edge of the networks all the IP flows which now needs to be forwarded onto the optical networks you aggregate them into the traffic flows you aggregate these traffic flows onto the traffic trunks and these traffic trunks are then mapped to the light paths and then you know uh, the traffic can be switched in the uh, optical cross connect. So, when the light paths are actually f uh, are provisioned uh, in the core of the networks uh, op in the wavelength router or in the optical cross connect this cross connect tables are set up and then the traffic trunk you know can be uh, can be switched because they have been mapped to the light path and the wavelength routers essentially will cross connect you know these light paths. So, what is the difference therefore, between the uh, labels and the label switch path that exist in the traditional networks and uh, that exist in the multi protocol lambda switch routers or a uh, multi protocol optical routers. Now, as you can see in MPLS uh, a label is basically a shim header okay, uh, uh, in, in, in a standard uh, uh, in a standard MPLS router and there the label switch router does some packet processing. Okay. Uh, it it uh, for example, it decrements the TTL count uh, then it looks uh, at the label, uh, it determines uh, that uh, on uh, by looking at the label it determines the next hop for forwarding and it also determines the label the, uh, the, la the next label that needs to be used. If we have used a label stack then uh, it will do the push and pop operation as well by looking at uh, the outer label and then uh, popping it off and forwarding the packets. Okay. However, in optical domain really a label is synonymous with the uh, wavelengths. Okay. The, the labels are the same as the wavelength and the wavelengths are not carried in the packets. So, the wavelength router performs switching of the optical channels you know, regardless of the traffic and the packets payload. Okay. So, so therefore, this is the difference uh, is that that the switching uh, in the multi protocol lambda switch router is of the wavelengths okay, and not of the labels which is there in the uh, uh, which, which is actually a header in the optical packets. Okay. So, here the wavelengths are actually switched. Uh, so, a label here is analogous to a wavelength. Now, you can clearly see that in the label switch router the label is 20 bit and therefore, you know uh, 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 between two MPLS nodes uh, ideally speaking you can have uh, 2 raised to power 20 label switched path. So, around 1 million label switch path can exist between two nodes. Now, here label in 
in optical network is analogous to a wavelength and you cannot have such large number of wavelength. So, therefore, the available label space in the optical networks is very limited and therefore, only limited light paths can be provisioned. So, while the granularity of FEC uh, in the MPLS node as you can as we had discussed can range from an application flow to a very coarse uh, which is actually a traffic trunk in the optical networks you can actually use light path only uh, for forwarding the traffic trunk. So, it is really necessary that you aggregate all these flows into traffic trunk and then map the traffic trunks onto the light path because the available label space is actually restricted or limited. So, uh, so this is what the point here is that the available label space is large in MPLS, but label space actually becomes a great constraint in optical transport networks. So, here the light path are basically analogous to the traffic trunk in the MPLS networks. The granularity of an FEC or a label switch path cannot be broken down to an application level flow uh, uh, as in a, in a standard MPLS based network. Now, what are the uh, label operations in the multi protocol? Uh, uh, lambda switch routers. Note uh, that uh, in uh, uh, standard MPLS you can do various operations. For example, uh, several LSPs you can nest it into a bigger LSPs and you can do a hierarchical uh, nesting of the LSPs. You can do push pop uh, uh, and swap operations on the label. None of such operations are possible in the multi protocol lambda switch routers. So, it cannot do a label merging also. So, therefore, an optical cross connect based label switch router cannot merge the traffic coming from two LSPs into a uh, single LSP. Now, this is uh, this is this is possible to do uh, in a uh, standard MPLS routers, but it is not possible to do uh, in a optical cross connect based MPLS routers. Similarly, the uh, label push and pop operations cannot be performed. Okay. So, in that sense you can see that optical cross connect or label switch routers are more similar to an ATM based uh, uh, LSR okay, rather than to a generalized uh, 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 IP based uh, MPLS uh, uh, router. Okay. So, they are more akin to the MPLS uh, LSR. As you can see in the MPLS LSR you cannot have an hierarchy of uh, virtual circuit path only one hierarchy is defined that is a virtual circuit path are bundled into a virtual path. You cannot have an arbitrary hierarchy of the virtual circuit path. So, so therefore, you know the difference of the uh, MPLS based optical cross connects or wavelength routers is very similar to something like an ATM LSR. In an IP MPLS based router, you can actually have any hierarchy of the or any aggregation of these label switch paths into a bigger label switch path. What are the other challenges? Uh, the, there are other challenges for, uh, for making MPLS as the common control plane uh, including the in, in, uh, in optical networks. The other some of the other challenges are the bandwidth granularities in MPLS LSP uh, is very high whereas, the uh, optical bandwidth allocation is quite coarse. Okay. So, this this point we have already discussed. Now, moreover the number of links or the fibers with hundreds of wavelength uh, between nodes will be very large okay. uh, and uh, that leads and therefore, you know we need to do an IP address assignment to each channel. So, that poses a problem and also there is an excessive management problem to determine which channel of a local port is connected to which channel of a remote port. Okay. So, these are basically the practical deployment problems that will arise. Uh, uh, when you are using an uh, uh, wavelength based routers and of course, we need to then have a uh, fast fault detection and restoration mechanisms also. Uh, so, you need to set up alternate light paths or backup light paths and user data is uh, transparent user data is transparently switched. Okay. Uh, so, there is no processing of the packets here in the optical cross connects or wavelength routers. So, therefore, the control plane transmissions you know it must be decoupled. 
uh, completely from the data plane because optical cross connects or wavelength routers they really do not process the packets ok. So, uh, they do not look at the headers of the packets to determine whether it is a control packet or whether it is a data packet and then take a decision. So, therefore, the control plane transmission must be completely different than the data plane transmissions in the optical network. So, these are the some of the challenges you know which needs to be met uh, when using op MPLS as the single control plane in optical transport. So, that requires certain extensions to the MPLS uh, for optical networks. As you already say, said that uh, 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 in the core of the networks, when we are using OSPF for distributing the optical transport network topology, you actually may require extensions to uh, OSPF also. Uh, and when you set up these uh, traffic engineered light paths in the core of the networks, then you also need signaling protocols to convey uh, these uh, uh, th light path to the optical cross connect. So, therefore, you need extensions to the signaling protocols also. So, a whole lot of these extensions are required and uh, uh, so extensions to routing protocol as you can see are required like uh, extensions to OSPF. Uh, so, you need to introduce the concept of generalized representation of the link types, uh, you need to introduce the concept of bandwidth on the wavelength. We may also incorporate sometimes <coughs> properties of the optical fiber also like optical fiber dispersion and attenuation characteristics. You know, this is interesting because we may take into account the optical fiber dispersion and attenuation characteristics also to determine the best possible path. And then the link production type. So, these, these uh, uh, attributes uh, and extensions need to be done uh, or added to the routing protocols like OSPF, uh, which are used to determine the uh, light paths uh, in the core of the optical networks. We also need extensions to the existing signaling protocols, uh, basically CRLDP or RSVPTE, which are used to convey the uh, traffic trunk attributes to the label switch routers. And then of course, uh, there is a link management protocol that is required to perform the link management. Uh, so, these, these are essentially the extensions which are uh, which are required uh, for the um, existing optical networks uh, uh, when you want to use the MPLS as an integrated uh, peer to peer networks. So, in, in summary, uh, let me uh, just summarize our discussion on the uh, MPLS based uh, networks and then we will move on to the different topic. Uh, now, in summary what we actually saw uh, that historically MPLS was proposed to address the challenges of uh, IP forwarding based on longest prefix match, uh, but it was uh, soon discovered that this is not uh, so much of a serious problem because uh, the forwarding based on uh, uh, forwarding based on longest prefix match have been addressed by using very sophisticated IP forwarding algorithms. But it was discovered then that MPLS this label based forwarding paradigm can be very successfully used to address the traffic engineering challenges of the IP networks. So, that is one of the primary applications of MPLS today in the IP networks to address the traffic engineering challenges. Okay. Then uh, IP has its own QoS model in terms of integrated services and differentiated services. It was then found that MPLS actually helps that IP QoS model. So, by extension of these differentiated services and integrated services paradigm to the MPLS based networks, we can actually provide the quality of service guarantees uh, or can set up the guaranteed bandwidth label switch path or virtual circuit in the core of the networks. So, actually uh, by using that MPLS can actually dislodge all the advantages that existed of the ATM based networks in the core. Okay. ATM was actually able to provide quality of service guarantees or bandwidth guaranteed virtual circuit paths and it was also able to do the traffic engineering challenges by using virtual circuit routing. Both these concepts were now incorporated in IP MPLS QoS router. So, that solves not only this problem, but it is also acting now on the variable length IP packets. So, therefore, you do not have the additional overhead of segmentation and reassembly. Moreover, a single IP 
based paradigm is in operation, you do not have a problem in terms of excessive management. Okay. So, that, that problem uh, you know gets resolved. Uh, even though uh, I must say here that an additional problem gets introduced in terms of uh, operations, administrations and maintenance of the and provisioning of these MPLS based networks and that is still an active open uh, research area. Uh, as an I, as an offshoot or as a byproduct of uh, the traffic engineering capabilities of the MPLS, uh, we saw that it has a great potential of becoming a control plane for the optical cross connects or the optical transport networks also. So, there you know this is another interesting applications uh, that has uh, that, that uh, has come up in the optical cross connect is that that by making extensions of the MPLS networks to a generalized framework which is called as a GMPLS or generalized multi protocol lambda switch uh, routers. Okay. We can also have uh, applications of the MPLS to be a, a single unified control plane for the optical cross connect. That is another you know second enabling applications of the uh, MPLS. So, traffic engineering, IPQOS, control plane for optical networks, these are the three major enabling applications of the MPLS networks. Now, there are several you know uh, by uh, product applications uh, sort of uh, of uh, having these traffic engineered load balanced path in the optical networks. You can uh, provide uh, 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 virtual private networks kind of applications over an MPLS network. So, this uh, IP VPN model uh, can now work over an uh, MPLS based networks also giving rise to what we call as an MPLS VPN networks. We have not discussed uh, that aspect in our lectures, but that is another interesting applications of the MPLS based networks. So, in summary I would say that uh, uh, MPLS provides a powerful framework for uh, traffic engineering as well as the control plane for the next generation uh, uh, next generation IP networks based both on pure IP forwarding or based on uh, optical cross connects in the core of the networks. So, before we uh, close our discussion on the MPLS, I thought let me just uh, uh, briefly tell you what work we have done uh, in, in, in the space of MPLS networks. So, basically let me just give you an overview of uh, uh, our uh, MPLS based network. Uh, we have developed uh, an uh, implementation uh, of uh, uh, MPLS forwarding engine in Linux kernel. An MPLS forwarding engine in uh, Linux kernel and uh, we have also done a, a Linux based uh, a Linux based uh, multi threaded label distribution protocol which is uh, LDP and then we have a, a Linux based MPLS emulator. So, these are the four aspects you know uh, we had uh, we have developed. Uh, some of the features uh, which I would like to tell you of uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, you know this forwarding engine uh, are. So, some of the features of our forwarding engine are forwarding engine feature which is implemented in the uh, Linux kernel is that it is uh, quite scalable uh, and we have deployed and we have used it in the Linux kernel and supports uh, IP v 4 routing currently and supports uh, IP v 4 routing. And 
it is extensible also so the implementation is an extensible uh, implementation as well uh, as far as the label distribution uh, uh, protocol is uh, is there so the multi threaded label distribution protocol which uh, we have developed so a multi threaded uh, ldp is uh, so it's, it's, it's like there is a thread for uh, socket handler. So, we the threads are there are three threads essentially the three main threads there is a socket handler, there is a process handler, and there is an event handler. So, this is a socket handler, and uh, this is a process handler, and uh, this is an uh, and event handler. So, so, it manages the socket queue and there are event queue here. So, here is an event queue and these are socket queue here. Okay. So, so this can, so this design can automatically capture the routing changes. So, it can capture the routing changes on the fly. So, it can capture routing changes on the fly and it per can perform the corresponding actions, you know, uh, successfully. Uh, so, uh, the other thing is uh, that we have developed is a uh, Linux based MPLS uh, emulator. So, this is uh, the third thing that we have developed is a Linux based uh, MPLS uh, emulator. So, this is Linux uh, based emulator which we call it to be uh, it can lime okay. and uh, this is like uh, uh, you know the motivation really was to develop it as a protocol development environment and it can also be used to uh, uh, you know to test uh, the traffic engineering algorithms uh, uh, and so on. So, now this is uh, so here it, it leverages on the uh, switching engine design that we have done it in the Linux kernel and also the uh, multi threaded uh, label distribution protocol. So, it is leveraging upon uh, these two works uh, our M our Linux based MPLS emulator. So, let me just tell you how this uh, emulator has been designed. So, the the top level view is that, that there is a master LSR controller. So, there are three major components here is that master LSR controller and then there is an event manager. and then there is of course, a script parser. So, you can so script parser means you know you know uh, any topology you can give through uh, TCLTK script and the script parser then gives a topology uh, that the knowledge about the topology of the networks comes to a master LSR controller and uh, an event manager essentially you know manages various events. Uh, in the emulator. So, this entire implementation both the multi threaded design of the label distribution protocol, the switching engine in the Linux kernel and the lime all are available in the public domain which uh, people can download and use it for uh, their reference uh, purposes. Uh, uh, many people have been actively using this design. There are of course, future extensions that are required to be done uh, in the lime particularly current support includes only uh, the provision of static label switch path. We need we yet to incorporate the establishment of the dynamic LSP based on the routing changes. So, this this extension still needs to be done. So, this is the work that has been carried out in the area of uh, MPLS uh, domain uh, uh, here uh, at IIT Bombay. So, this concludes uh, you know my discussion on the MPLS networks, uh, the motivation for it, its applications and what work actually we have done here to demonstrate the concept.